some is you know something non hockey related to start the podcast. You know, by the way, it's recording now. Um, I because before we logged on, I read something about National Treasure Two that I of or National Treasure did. Three that I wanted your opinion on. Okay. I don't know if you saw this rumor, but Nick Cage is out publicly saying publicly. that it won't happen. That National Treasure 3 won't happen. He said, quote, if you want to find treasure, don't look at Disney or something like that. Wow. This is great YouTube content, by the way. Is it? <laughs> well, I, I so... I don't know what your take is on that. I know you're a movie guy. I would say, I would say, if you're Disney, just sell it if you're not going to make the movie. Yeah, I mean, if you're refusing to make it, I mean, I'm kind of with Nick Cage because can you name a current Disney movie that has oversold what they've expected, or at least expected in the last, like, Three to five years. If you take out the marbles, which have even been flopped since in uh, Endgame, then, then yeah. there's no, there's not a Disney movie that exceeded expectations uh, at all. Um, not even Avatar The Way of Water was as big as I think I thought it would be ahead of time. Um, the other thing about Disney is they, so they have their own streaming service, right? But they also yes. put out that that national treasure tv show on uh their disney plus platform which was horrible the acting was bad um and it was just not good so i don't know if that has something to do with it or not but anyway i would love to see the trilogy finally completed because i think there's a rich storyline there and um you know, I, I get that some of those things are problematic now, but like, I don't know. I, I think it would be a good movie. I mean, there, you could even do like a prequel, even with like the Knights Templar or whatever, but that's just me. I don't know. I think you could do a show out of it. I mean, you could even take like a Nicolas Cage out if you really want to and do like a spinoff with. They did, and it was bad. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. It's tough to find the actors. Right. They brought back the sidekick there, Riley. And that was really, um, I mean, besides even just not even the actors, but also just bring in someone who can direct and create the movie. I mean, look at everyone so upset about uh, all the Marvel movies that are coming out. I mean, I saw a video that like all the people Disney is hiring is people who don't even read the actual comics or care about the comics. Right. It's like, it's like, this is, this makes no sense. Like, why are you hiring people who don't fully understand? Like, there's, it's literally written. There's a comic book or whatever written. Why don't you just follow it? Yeah. yeah. It's already lays the groundwork for you. Right. And a lot of it is about what producers they bring in to put on the movies and, and stuff. And, you know, it's really just a lot of recycled content. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So speaking of bringing people in and recycled content, <laughs> uh, I would have loved to make a Golden Knights, Knights Templar transition, but we're just going to leave that in the end. Um but Kyle, I got to say, now that we're actually do, starting the podcast, first of all, welcome in everybody. Um, now that we're actually starting the podcast, I will <laughs> lead with your Stanley Cup pick looks better and better by the day. The only thing is, I, I think it's safe to say you got the Eastern Conference participant wrong. <laughs> but I digress. I could certainly see a situation where my Eastern Conference pick and your Western Conference pick slash winners actually face each other in the Stanley Cup. So we'll get to that in a second. But for our audience, we apologize for the delayed recording. It's been a long time. But there's a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of frozen ice now that we have to get to. And part of that was the trade deadline from last Friday. We just teased it, but the Vegas Golden Knights seem to be going all in. Um in a way that I don't think I've seen in the modern era. And I have a larger take as, you know, as it pertains to building rosters in the NHL, but I'll leave that uh, for a few minutes. 
Kyle, I want to get your I want to get your thoughts on what Vegas has done at the trade deadline, bringing in uh, Noah Hannafin, Tomas Hurdle, and Anthony Mantha um, to go along with their already Stanley Cup roster, and they really didn't lose a lot of uh, NHL talent to get those guys in. So, what's your take on the uh, Vegas Golden Knights and their quest to repeat? Um, to be honest, this is like. This has got to be the scariest thing for any team out in the West, just seeing the Knights just stack up basically at the center position. But, like, now they're going to move these centers to go play wings. And it's just, how do you stop it? Like, it's not like it's one line, two lines. It's literally probably going to be three lines to four lines they're going to have when Stone gets back healthy and uh, Thomas, once they get healthy again, it's just like, Eichel just got back from injury. It's like these guys are just getting healthy at the right time. How do you stop it? And Hill is playing off his butt. And we all know playoff hockey is very physical, and they have a very – they probably have the deepest team right now going into the playoffs. I'm, I'd i be scared. I No matter who you are, what they did, phenomenal. I'd say they're probably the supervillains of the current NHL, if I'm going to say. So full stop right now, their top six is probably going to be an iteration of – Barbashev, Eichel, Marcheseau. By the way, those guys won him a Stanley Cup last year. Uh, second line, probably a combination of Hurdle, Stevenson, and Mantha. And then you have William Carlson as your third line center. And that's just the forwards. Their defense yeah. pairings now with Petrangelo and Han- Hannafin. And then mm-hmm. they have Theodore and McNabb. And then, of course, White Cloud on their third pair. That's dangerous. So they're top to bottom. They're not like you said. They're not a top heavy team. They are a well balanced team, and they have the goaltending to go, to go with it. It's not like when Darcy Kemper was a passenger when Colorado won the cup. It it, it is their goaltending is a strength. It's not just last year it was sort of they caught lightning in a bottle, right? And it worked out. This year it's like actually a strength again. And not they're they're not lucky. Um, if they can get Martinez back as well, um, they have, they'll have Mark Stone, Alec Martinez, and Thomas Hurdle on their injured reserve right now. If those three guys come back, people are going to get pushed out of the lineup. But the Knights are going to be top to bottom the most complete team in the NHL. Agreed. It's like you said, it's scary how deep it is. Like even if another guy gets hurt, they don't have to worry about one of the top players being missed easy for them to replace <clears throat> right away and the other scary thing is a lot of these guys are under contract for another like three to four years so it's not like anyone's going to be leaving anytime soon the tough thing for vegas though and we'll get to this when we talk about the rest of the conference is they have right now they're the eight seed right so they're going to be the second wild card more than likely if the season it were to end today and of course there's about 18 games left yeah. for most teams you're going to get a first round matchup with Vancouver and Vancouver I would also point out is probably the second most complete team in the league mm-hmm. so that would that's a little bit of an issue for Vegas um but you know last year they kind of had they had some situations where they faced a little bit of adversity. So um, because they had that really hot start and then they sort of cooled off. Same sort of thing this year. It seems eerily familiar. Another team that seems eerily familiar to last year is the Florida Panthers, who also made the Stanley Cup in 2023. They didn't make as many splashes in terms of quantity, but they acquired Vladimir Tarasenko, who seems to be the the latest and greatest trade deadline acquisition uh, every year. But What do you make of Florida and what their team looks like post-trade deadline? I mean, like we just talked about the Knights, it's just adding more depth and more firepower to that already deadly offensive power they have. Not just even talking about bringing in, what is it, Halberg they're bringing to at goaltending, backup goaltending to bring in there for the playoffs. It's like they're they're going making sure that they can beat everyone. Um, They can beat the Bruins. They can beat the Maple Leafs. And, that division, they've got to also probably think about, okay, we're probably going to have to go face, if they do make it all the way, the Rangers. And the Rangers are another tough team with a very hot goaltender right now. Yeah. So that 
I, I'm pretty sure that's why they're loading up right now. It's smart for them to be loading up. Yeah, I mean, the, I'm looking at their top six too. You know, I'm not going to pretend I know, know this off the top of my head, but it, it took me a second to pull it up. I mean, right now, Ekblad, Rodriguez, and Bennett are all day to day or out. But like, even with them out, their top six right now, as it stands, is Tarasenko, Sasha Barkov, Sam Reinhart, Carter Verhage, and Anton Lindell, and uh, Matt Kachuk. All right, that's just as good as Vegas is in in, in terms of depth. Um, you know, because you also have Okposo, who they acquired, Kyle Okposo, and uh, uh, Itu yeah. Lusterainen, right, on their third line. So, yeah, they, they're they're strong. You mentioned the Rangers. The Rangers, um, they didn't make huge splashes, I would say, compared to last year when they got Patrick Kane and um, Tarasenko, right? I- but uh, they they did pull in uh, Jack Roslovic from Columbus, and they they still have a really strong team. In terms of injuries, they're dealing with Truba and Wheeler both out who are key pieces, but New York is another team that's playing hot lately, and New York is, I think, 7-2-1. and one. I'm looking at the standings in their last 10, and they've won three in a row. So post-trade de- deadline, the Rangers are doing sort of the opposite of what happened last year. Last year after the trade deadline, they, they didn't really gel. It seems like they're gelling. You know, they didn't mess up the chemistry there. And, you know, if, if we're talking about the teams that I feel the most – strong about post trade day, trade deadline or go obviously like we talked about Vegas and Florida but then it's New York. Do you think New York can get over the hump because they, they they'll got they'll have to go through Carolina in their division at some point, probably at home at this point. But but then there's a there's a rising Flyers team and the Islanders have been hot. So, do you think their road to the conference finals is going to be easier or harder than last year? Oof. I'd say probably right now, I'd say it's probably a little bit easier. I mean, what they ran to last year is very unfortunate. Um, they also, like I said, you missed with the, the key part. Chemistry last year is what killed them. And right now their chemistry is phenomenal. I mean, look at what they brought in. Rampy, that rookie, he's already tearing up the NHL right now. I mean, they've got a, they've got a guy who is going to be physical throughout the playoffs. That's how the Bruins play. Look at Truba. That's just how playoff hockey yeah. is. Very bringing in more physical power to buff up that D is going to be scary. They're they're going to be a physical team. Don't get me wrong. I think that's how they're going to play in the playoffs. If they don't, I don't think they're going to go far if they're not playing physical enough. Yeah. Um, especially dumping the dumping the puck in. I think that's just how their offense runs. So for them, I am surprised. And then we don't forget we're not even talking about Quick, the backup goaltender, right? Um, He's had a hot year. Like it's not like they have one hot goaltender. Quick is on fire. I mean, if Shesterkin has a bad game or two, you could throw Quick in. It's not like he's gonna have a bad time this year. Well, it's not like it's not like Jonathan Quick's never played in the Stanley Cup playoffs, right? He's got two oh. rings on his finger, right? And 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 Clon Smythe to his name. You know, if they had to turn to him in the postseason, he could easily do the job. I think LA right now is looking at that and you know, we'll get to their goaltending situation maybe if we have time. But I, if I'm the Kings, I'm thinking, shit, I really should have held on to Jonathan Quick last year and given him a short-term deal to finish his career out here because uh, he's doing he he's doing the dirty work in L, in uh, in New York that way that Shesterkin doesn't have to handle the load on it all on his own. And you've seen Shesterkin have a better second half of the season yep. as a result of quick strong play, because it's not all on him. Correct. And uh, that that's scary. So elsewhere in that division, we're going to stay out East here. Carolina made some interesting moves. They picked off Evgeny Kuznetsov from the, uh, the by the way, guys, the European names I'm going to continue to butcher. I hope that's <laughs> all right with everyone. Um, they picked up him off of uh, waivers or be with the Capitals or something. I think the Capitals had waived him and then he ended up at the AHL. Then he was dealt or something, but they, they acquire him from Washington. He's a veteran center. They also bring in um, uh, Jake Gensel with a trade. They flip bunting for Gensel. I think that's an upgrade, Um, but Carolina is also showing that, that they're heading for it. You know, they're not, 
they're not intimidated by the Rangers. They know the Devils are having a down year. They know the division is really, and they know the Islanders are streaky, but still going to probably finish behind them. So they're they're going for it right now. And I think the writing's on the wall. They waived Auntie Ranta. Uh, they are, I think, going to go in all in with Freddie Anderson and maybe go mm-hmm. to Kachikov if they have to. But I, I like that team. I like that team top to bottom. Their defense is really strong. Uh, you know, you got Orlop playing on your third uh, your third pairing. What do you think of uh, Carolina? I mean, I like it. I like the moves because their big issue has been the last few games is scoring the puck and getting goals. That's been their big concern, at least the last few games. I say most of the season as well. Uh, I know they started the season off very slow, but they've started to pick it up. Um, but these trades address the issue. Hopefully this <clears throat> their chemistry with these two new players can gel pretty quick the next 18 games that are remaining before playoffs. Cause to be honest in the playoffs we saw, it ain't going to be low scoring. It's going to be pretty high scoring what we saw from last. Year. And it doesn't matter what kind of goaltender you have, you better put the puck in or you're just not going to win. Right. And, and, you know, they have, their defense is strong enough, like where they could win a game, you know, they could win a game three to two, but they could also beat you six to four. Um, you know, that's, that's just how they are. I mean, Aho is, you know, top, I, I'd say a top 10 center in the league. Um, you know, there's still Jordan Stahl who's been there, done that. Um, you know, Brett Burns on defense. I mean, it's not like he's never played in big games. Um, so yeah, they, they're, they're going to, they're going to be a force. Um, Slavin and Burns will wear people down. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, you got Orloff playing on your third pair. Uh, you know, they're going to be a tough out. Um, so going to stay out East because like last year, it seems like all the big teams that are making moves are out East. Um, but the Leafs, they bring in uh, Dewar and Joel Edmondson. Um, I think I forget his first name, um, but they, they bring in Dewar and they bring in Edmondson, not huge moves. They don't have a lot of cap space. Of course, you and I have been pretty critical. Um, as I said, I'm not getting any Christmas cards from uh, the folks in uh, the Toronto area. Um, but you know, they're, they're going to be a tough out for the Bruins in the first round, probably, or if they drop, um, you know, maybe Tampa or Detroit or somebody, um, or Florida, I honestly, any who, no matter who the least play, they are going to be a tough out because they still have that star power. But what do you make of their moves bringing in those two guys? I think it's good for them because it starts to take some pressure off some of their youngsters on the blue line because they've been pretty hurt um, with injuries um, with their blue or defensemen right now. So bringing these guys in definitely addresses that huge issue, which is when <clears throat> leaving the one dimensional the entire time. So I think for them, it's beautiful. Plus, these guys are very physical defend defensemen. So, like, they need this going into the playoffs. Um, my only, I mean, I love what they're doing. They're addressing their issues, but I just don't know if I trust them going into the playoffs in general, just through their history. Um, so unfortunately, great job. But unfortunately, I don't see see them going too far just because of their luck for some reason. They seem to have more snarl to them this year. Like the Bruins just got done last week playing them twice in four days. So I got a pretty yeah. good look at Toronto. They have a little bit more physicality or, or snarl to them. I mean, they're burning in Bertuzzi in the offseason. Mm-hmm. They've got Ryan Reeves, Max Domi. Those guys are playing with a little bit of a chip on uh, on Thursday night a week ago, um, but they they don't really have like, and I don't want to eat my words in six weeks if they eliminate the Bruins, but to me, like I I don't look at them and see a confident team. It seems like they're the kind of team that is going to start gripping their stick a little bit harder, and like these guys, whether it's Edmonton or Connor Dewar. They come in and they join the Leafs. They're going to have huge expectations, right? Like, even though it wasn't a big trade deadline for them, you know, they've had bigger trade deadlines. Mm. You know, they they have a little bit of pressure, or I would say a lot of pressure on them. And these guys know, they know what the goal is. The goal, they won a round last year, right? But the goal now, I think, would be to make the conference final and come out of the East. Uh, Sorry, the uh, Atlantic. Um, that's what I think they they want to do. I mean, a lot of people, including you and me, picked them to win the division this year, and they're going to probably be third. So they're looking up at Boston and Florida again, 
And I don't know. It would you be if you were a Toronto Maple Leafs fan? Would you? want to face the Bruins in the first round or would you want to face Florida? I mean, who would you rather face? Uh, to be honest, I'd rather face the Bruins um, just because of how they've been playing the last few months or so. The Bruins haven't been the hottest team, but they were at least early in the season too. They haven't been so consistent, especially losing a lot of close games as we have talked about. Um, off the podcast about going to overtime multiple times and then just not finishing the game or giving up late goals. In a team like the Maple Leafs, you just can't give up those late goals, especially like Austin Matthews. You give up those late goals, it just gives them more confidence to rally. Um, not saying the Bruins are a bad team. I do – they have great goaltending right now. Um, but the Panthers are just, I think, way too hot right now in that division to want to go and play at least right away. Right. Chances are, though, if the Bruins, chances are the Bruins would only not play the Maple Leafs if the Bruins got to one, then you would put Florida at two, most likely. That would be the only way. I don't think, I don't think those three, those top two might go back and forth. Like the Bruins still could catch Florida because they have two games left with Florida. Yeah. Um, But I don't think Toronto is going to go higher than three but I don't see Toronto dropping to four. You know what I mean? So I I think if, if they, if they do drop to four and the Bruins stay at two, then they play Florida or, you know what I mean? So I I think the the missing piece in the Atlantic division is probably going to be summed up with like Tampa or Detroit or somebody like that, but we'll get to that later. As, as for the Bruins, you're right. They, they didn't have a ton of cap space like, like Toronto to make a lot of moves this, this past week. Um, but they also sort of didn't give up anything, right? Like I was worried that the Bruins were going to get scared that they had five pending UFAs on their NHL roster um, and trade one of them. They didn't do that. They held on to Grizzlick. They held on to Forbert. They held on to Shattenkirk and J- James Van Riemsdyk. And they, and DeBrusque. And they sort of stood pat in that regard, but they added a couple NHLers. They added Andrew Peak and Pat Maroon. They'll give them a little bit uh, extra physicality, but they 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 didn't really worry too much. Um, with this potential matchup with Toronto, though, I would point out that even though the Bruins have been inconsistent um, and they've left a lot of points on the table, they're four zero against Toronto this year. Um. I think they match up well with the Leafs. What they they don't really match up well with a team that, um, let's see, a team like, hmm, I I would say a, a, the teams they've struggled with this year have been teams like Detroit, right? Who who have a really good power play, and I know I'm mentioning things that the Leafs are also good at, but but I think that with with the Bruins they have sort of this history with Toronto where they know what Toronto wants to do and they can adapt to that. I think the Bruins are comfortable playing in a low scoring game. I don't think the Bruins are comfortable playing a team like Edmonton, right? Who they've struggled against, right? Like they've struggled against the uh, Oilers this year with two overtime games that were high scoring because they, the skill and speed of, the Oilers is something that the Bruins aren't used to. I, I'm sort of going on a tangent here, but I think the Bruins are able to match up against um, against uh, the Leafs in a way that makes it so that, look, they might lose, right? But they're, I don't think they're – I don't think th- they would be, f- be forced by Toronto to play a style of hockey that they don't want to play. Does that make sense? Like – no, that makes sense. You're making total sense about it. Um, like you said, struggling. I mean, the only other like we talk, like you brought it up is like the second Oilers game. Like Oilers were down and they came back ten overtime and won. Um, like you said, I think the biggest issue is a team they have to play that has speed, and that seems to be the big issue. Um, 
especially if they got to play like Florida. Florida's going to have a lot of speed this year. They got to play the Rangers. We saw them struggle against the Rangers. Yeah, they, like, yeah, that's true. Well, they, so. I mean, they like to be fair, and, you know, Bruins hat aside, I'm actually wearing a Red Sox hat, but you know what I mean? The Bruins are 6-0 and against Toronto and Florida this year. So yeah. it's it, it, like this this narrative, like, look, like in February they in, in January, I'd say end of January till about now, so the last six weeks or so, they've played a shit ton of overtime games and lost a lot of those. But that's what's keeping them at the top of the standings, right? Like if those are regulation losses, no offense, but they'd be down like with the Devils and the Islanders and, you know, the teams like that. But these close games, like, yeah, they lose, but, you know, that's keeping them in the standings pretty high. And they still, while they've struggled against Detroit or New York, they've done really well against Tampa, against Florida, and against Toronto. And those are the teams that matter in their division right now. Correct, but the issue is you can't do that in the playoffs. You can't let teams hang well, I around. Think the Bruins know that. I mean, look at last year; they blew two game, two leads, right? Like it, to lose to lose the play last two games of the season uh, that they played. Yeah. So, like, I they know that. Um, I think a lot of it will have to do with their penalty kill, and a lot of it will have to do with their team defense. Um, speaking of team defense. And switching conferences, though, the Stars added to their blue line. They bring in Chris Tanev. Um, Do you like the Stars at all in the West? Or do you really think that it's up to, you know, the Jets who brought in um, who brought in uh, Tyler Toffoli or the Vancouver Canucks who brought in Elias Lindholm or the Knights who we've talked about? Do you see the do you see the Stars in that picture? Unfortunately, no. Right now, I mean, I just don't see it. Like, Winnipeg's get a hot goalie. They brought in so much good talent for themselves. I, Winnipeg's putting themselves on the map, unfortunately. And then also, you look at the Avalanche. They just stacked That's their true. team with uh, Sean Walker, for example. Like, they brought, they boosted their defense. They boosted their other lines. Uh, I know they gave up a lot, too. But, like, I just – I feel like the Stars are just, like, still just staying mediocre instead of taking that shot that they should have taken to try to compete with that tough Western conference. Yeah. I think the stars are relying a little bit too much on their old stars for lack of a better uh, term. You know, Joe Pavelski's up there in age now, right? Like they do have some young guys, Robertson and whatnot, but in, in Heights, but the, you know, they're, they're a little bit and Jamie Ben, they're relying a lot on still. Um, they've been playing without Tyler Sagan for a little while. But I and Ryan Suter's up there in age. Like you're right, and Tanev, it's not like he's a spring chicken. But I, you know, I think I think their game plan is, oh well, we get to the playoffs. Ottinger's just going to play out of his mind, and we're going to win rounds that way. That could happen, but I mean, if, if they they must know that the rest of the contenders in the West also have really good goaltending, maybe outside of the Kings and the um, avalanche. I don't even say the goaltending is a strength of those teams. I don't think it sucks, but I don't think it's a strength. But when you look at Winnipeg with Hellebuck and Demko in Vancouver, you know, it, I don't think you can rely on Ottinger, right? Because if you're in a series against those guys, yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to play out of their mind too, probably. Um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't rule out the stars to make a run because they've done it. I mean, they've done it. What last year? I think they made it to the conference final, if I'm not mistaken. And then a couple of years ago, they were in the in the bubble in the cup final. Um, so I mean, they're an experienced group. Ben and Sagan and and company have and Pavelski have been there. Um, but you know, there's, there's still a lot uh, a lot to be desired. I'd say com- if you compare them to the rest of the conference. So Kyle, we talked about the playoff teams. Who's on the bubble? All right. And let's stick out West because we just we just we've been talking about the stars. Um who's on your bubble out west? Okay, let me pull up first. So out west. This is tough. I mean, looking out west, I it's a pretty much of a big guy. I don't think, to be honest, anyone on the outside for the West is looking in. To be honest, I don't think anyone. I think right now is what you have solidified for your 
playoffs, which is unfortunate, but I don't think there's a shot. Just so looking at it. Sorry, go ahead. So, so just looking at it right now, you have Nashville at 80 points, and you have the Knights at 77 points. The next closest is the Blues at 71, Minnesota at 71, and then you have the Kraken at 86 or 68. I I don't see any of those three teams making a jump to surpass those two. No, I mean, if Calgary hadn't lost three in a row and the Kraken hadn't lost two in a row and the um, Blues, sorry, the um, the Predators, if they had, you know, played a – oh, sorry, not the Predators. The Blues in the Wild and the Kraken, sorry. If those teams yeah. hadn't been as streaky as they've been, like in Calgary's lost three in a row, Seattle's lost two in a row, Blues – are only four, five, and one in their last ten, even though they beat the Bruins a couple nights ago. Um, in the wild, they had that crazy game where they pulled their goalie in overtime. But I just think, like you, the gap's too big. The only thing I would point out is that um, the Blues and the Wild, I think, are still in striking distance. Yeah. But Vegas is ahead of them and Vegas is only going to get better. I don't think the Blues and the Wild are going to get better than they are right now. Um I... like and they're going to have a lot of ground to make up plus Vegas has a game in hand. And then I think Seattle and Calgary it's over. I mean they've just played so poorly this week that this was the week where they where they have games in hand on the Blues and the Wild but they didn't make anything of them. So, you know, if, they, if they're not careful, they're going to end up getting jumped by the Coyotes or something. You know, so that's – and then, of course, Calgary did a fire sale and, and Seattle's just sort of wavering. But, yeah, I'm with you. I think the playoff teams in the West are sort of set. It's just a matter of seeding. Correct. We haven't talked about the Kings at all. Um, just while we're talking about the West, like, do you have any thoughts on the Kings? Uh absolutely terrible this trade deadline they didn't make a single move um i know they tried to make the trade with the bruins um for a goaltender but they're long term some of their best players or what they had to offer on injured reserve for a long period so they didn't have many pieces to give away and right now i think they're probably the weakest team maybe nashville i'd say nashville would be ahead of them slightly is probably the weakest team right now going into that Western Conference playoffs. Yeah, I think Nashville's actually playing really well. I mean, they, they're they 8 and 2 in their last 10. They're on a 10-game point streak. And I think Nashville is, if they get hot, they've got veterans there that can get them over the hump, I think, and they could play spoiler. I don't see the same thing with the Kings, like you said. I mean – Phoenix Copley's been hurt. I didn't really love him anyway. Um, th- there was the rumors about trying to get Allmark. I don't really know if I believe them because uh, there there really wasn't solid reporting on that. Um, Cam Talbot's been okay. He had a really good start to the year, but he's sort of cooled off. Their defense is sort of old. I mean, I love Drew Doughty. I think he's a Hall of Famer, but you know he, his his best days are behind him. Um, Denault's all right. I, I just I don't see the Kings being able to put together a run as constituted. Um, but they're still going to make the playoffs because the West is just so bad. I mean, if Calgary or Seattle were any good, they you know I this year and lived up to expectations and how good their rosters are, then they could have been a playoff team out of the Pacific. But instead, you're going to get it stuck with a mediocre Kings team. Uh, what about East? Speaking of hot teams, I think the Islanders are are starting to scare me. What, what do you, who do you think's on the bubble in the East? I think the Islanders are certainly there. Yeah, I mean the Islanders are seven and three in their last ten games, which is a bit scary. Um, getting hot at the right time, you could say. Um, but I do think that uh, Tampa and the Islanders both are still pretty close to knocking themselves out of the playoffs. I mean, you still got. Detroit has got the same number of points as um, 
the Islanders, but they're just a game behind. Um, Washington's right there at 69. Um, Buffalo at 67. Devils at 66. Pittsburgh at 65. With each team played about 64 to 65 games so far, 66. So, like, it's still pretty close. Like, these last few games could decide if your team is in or out. Yeah, the problem is it's sort of like with Seattle and Calgary. Pittsburgh's yeah. lost four in a row. The Devils, the Caps, and the Islanders uh, – sorry, the Devils and the Caps have both lost two in a row, and the Detroit Red Wings have lost six in a row. If Detroit had just played mildly better, they'd be ahead of Tampa in the in right. the Atlantic right now. Like, you know, because it's not like Tampa's been beating the door down. You know, they, they're – we haven't talked about them a lot, but, you know, they're very top-heavy, and they don't really scare me right now. Um, but – you know, Detroit losing six in a row, that's if, – if they don't make the playoffs, you're going to look back at this stretch post-trade down line, first two weeks of March, and say, what the hell happened? Um, you know, because they bring in Kane, right? They had that really good start, right? We saw him in person. But, you know, this week, if, if they could get passed by Buffalo or by the – um, Or by the Capitals or – Certainly the Islanders are right there with them and probably going to end up leapfrogging them pretty soon. I think the Islanders have played really well with um, with Patrick Waz, their coach. Uh, and I think that's a team that, as a Bruins fan, I've seen in the playoffs. I don't want to see them again. Um, but chances are the way it's going, Florida's going to see them. If the Bruins are second, you're probably going to end up with Florida playing the Islanders. And then you're going to end up with the Rangers playing Tampa. Um, Tampa. It might cross over depending on who's first and who's second in the wild card. Otherwise, you have the Rangers play the Islanders, which would be a great first round. And then you'd have Florida play Tampa. So you'd have the Battle of New York and the Battle of Florida. I think yeah. the league would like that better. Um, but it really depends on who finishes where. But you're right. If Pittsburgh hadn't sold and sucked the last week, I would say they're in it. Because Crosby's having a great year, but you know they've just looked awful. Oh, I know it's been Pittsburgh's having so much better. What this is gonna be like the first or second time they haven't made it with Crosby, um, on their team since drafting him. Yeah, and then right, right, and it, it would be it because I think they got knocked out last year too. Um, they they were right on the bubble, and it was actually Florida that ended up sliding in and making that big run. Um, but, but you know, your Devils, too. I mean, that's another team that's like, they're three and seven. They've struggled. They traded to Foley. If they were just marginally better the last, like, few weeks, they would be right there with the Islanders and the Lightning. So it's, um, it's, it's why the Bruins losing all those overtime games is fine. Because... Yeah, that extra they, point. If, if they lost, if they, if you took... Let's say that I'm looking at it. They've lost 15 overtime games with shootouts included. If they uh, had, most if, in the yeah shootouts included, most in the league too. You're right. Um, if they had, if seven of those games had been lost in regulation, they'd have 84 points, and the Maple Leafs would be right on their door, and they might end up having to play a road game or, or a road series. Um, you know. Or let's say they lost 10 of those in regulation, right? Mm. They'd be at 81 points. They'd be in fourth place in the division. So um, I, I don't know. I just, I would just point out that uh, that that's why, like, even if the Devils were three, three and four in their last 10, they'd have 70 points and they'd be that much closer to the Islanders. So it, it really is a game of inches when you or a game of points when you're talking about the playoff bubble. Oh no, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how the season finishes up in the next few weeks here. But like I said, any, like, I said like we just talked about, any of these four teams could jump up and two of them could take these, take Islanders and Tampa out of the playoffs. Just like that. Right. I mean, even, I mean, you could point, you could make a case for pretty much as far down as the Penguins. And I know that sounds crazy, but they're, they've got, they're 65 points. All right. Let me look at the wild card here. 
They've got 65 points. They are seven points back of the Islanders. And even though the Islanders have a game in hand, that's seven points is three games. I mean, three and a half games. And I don't know, they'll probably play each other, right? So the East yeah. is still, excuse me, very much to be determined okay. with 18 games to go. It's not like the West. There's not 10 points separating the playoff teams from the rest of the bubble. All right, speaking of the playoff teams, all right, it's safe to say that if they're in our top five power ranking, they are a playoff team. Yeah. Or at least a lock at this point with 18 games to go, to, to go for most teams. Um, let's start with the East. We just talked a lot about the East. Yeah. Who's on their bubble. But these teams are probably going to make it. So who are your top five in the East right now? Ooh, top five right now um, at – Number five, I'm going to go with the Boston Bruins right now as my number five. Put them low. I know you're upset. I just, I'm just not liking how they played recently. They're only four, two, and four. Um, hasn't been a great stretch for them right now. Um, and that number four, I'm going to be putting uh, actually the Islanders ahead of them right now based on overall success and how they've been playing. Um, and then. All right, can I stop you right there? Yeah. I, how they've been playing is true, but I'm going to push back on overall success. The Bruins are 19 points better than the Islanders. Well, yes, yes. So I'm don't saying... say overall success. Maybe say how they've been playing lately. Yes. Overall success? No. The Bruins have been a playoff team since day one. Yes, I know, but I'm just saying for <laughs> a short-term success. I'm okay, going... short-term success. All right, that's better. The Islanders right now would be the hotter team. Right now, yes, they are a hotter team at the moment, and they just waxed the Bruins a couple nights ago. Um, and then at number four, I would put uh, the Hurricanes. Um, I love what they're doing. Uh, I think it was just you mean number three. Yes, number three. Sorry, okay. sorry, yeah, number... sorry. Out of the box here. Uh, put them at number three. It was what was it just last week uh, or this week? Uh, Jack's first game for them or Jake's first game. So that was first time for him to get the ice with them. I really want to see how they put this all together and gel um, offensively to score more points. Um, and then at number two, I'm going to put the Rangers. I love what they're doing. Um, Rampy has been phenomenal for them, causing lots of havoc. I think he's a great addition for that team. Um, and then number one, I put the Panthers. The Panthers have just been so hot. They're also allowing, I think, the fewest amount of goals in the league right now, which is so very surprising. Um, so I just love what they're doing right now down in Florida. Right now, everything's clicking for them. Nice. I I, yeah, I I agree with Florida number one, so I'm giving that away now. Um, I had the Islanders at five because they have been pot. <laughs> uh, I had the pan. I had the Panthers, Chiefs, Carolina Hurricanes. They're not the NFL team. The Carolina Hurricanes at four, the same reasons you said. They made some big splashes at the deadline. They're going all in. They have a veteran group. I like it. And the Bruins at three, because no matter what you want to say about the Bruins in their overtime losses, they're still getting points. I've made that pretty clear. And they are they are playing uh, very well um, in uh, with their goaltending, despite – some of these losses, they've been close games. And I think they at, at their best, we've seen them beat the best teams in the league. Right? 4-0 four, four against the Leafs, 2-0 against the Panthers, 1-0-1 against the Canucks, 1-1 um, against the Jets. I mean, the list goes on against the top teams in the league. Um, number two, I have the Rangers. I think they're the second most complete team in the East. Uh, we talked about that at the top of the show. And uh, I think they're very balanced. And, of course, the Florida Panthers, I think, are the team to beat in the East right now. Um, but that might not be a good thing for them. That might raise expectations. But we'll see if Bobrovsky can get it done again in the postseason. And then while I'm at it, my wet, out West, I have Nashville as five. They're on a 10-game 10, 10 point streak. Um, I like the way they've been playing. Uh, Winnipeg, um, 
they're they're still around. I think as you know, they made they made some splashes getting to Foley at the deadline. That will help with some depth scoring. Um, it won't all be on their top players. Uh, I have Dallas at three, even though I'm not in love with Dallas. I still have to respect how they played. Um, they've still been consistently competitive in a very um, top heavy West. At two, I have Vancouver because I think Vancouver has stepped back a little bit. Um, they're still really good. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I think in the playoffs, they're going to be a team that you do not want to face. Even if you're a team like Vegas, um, they have the best point different uh, goal differential, excuse me, in the league. And um, even though they've struggled a little bit, you know, they still manage to get points and they're a really good road team. And then number one, I have the Colorado Avalanche. They've won five in a row. Um, and they've been a playoff team pretty much all year. They've been in the bubble or in the mix. Um, and they are got points in eight out of their last 10. And um, I think they're a team that's won the cup. And I would, I could argue they have one of the best defensemen in the league, one of the best centers in the league, and one of the best top lines in the league. And at that point, I would be hard pressed to not like Colorado um, still as my Western Conference favorite. What about your West? My West, um, actually, for. Uh, my number five, I actually have uh, the Edmonton Oilers as my number five right now. I know Nashville is hot. I'm excluding them right now. I just love what the Oilers have been doing offensively. It's just, I just don't know how you stop them. This, their firepower right now, incredible. Um, like always, uh, hitting at the right time, their cylinders. Skitter's playing a lot better now. Um, so I have them currently as my number five. And then just mixing up your Upper seeds. Um, I have Winnipeg at number four. They made some great trades, like you just talked about. And to Foley, goaltending has definitely ramped up, which is what they need. Um, and then at number three right now, I have Vancouver. Like we just said, they took a step back. Um, lost a few key games on the stretch here. Um, that's the reason why I have them knocked down. Then I have Dallas. Dallas has been playing phenomenal. I know we're not talking about playoffs right now, or being in the playoffs, but right now they're just hot, but we'll see when we get to time to the playoffs. And then, like you just said, Colorado, they had the MVP on their team um, with McKinnon. So, like, right now they're the hottest team out West, not including, you know, I love the Knights, but right now these are the top five best teams out West. Yeah, it's crazy that we spent the first <clears throat> minutes of the show talking about, well, we were talking about National Treasure, but uh, we were talking about – the Knights and how much we love them, but we didn't have them in our top five. And I think that's exactly how Bruce Cassidy wants his team. He wants you to overlook his team, despite all these moves that they've made and how deep they are. We're still overlooking them in our power rankings, but you have them as your Stanley cup winner. I'm going to stick with the Carolina hurricanes, as my Stanley cup winner. Um, I think it's come been a long time coming for them. And uh, I think the, I think they're going to get hot. Um, interesting thing though, is a lot of people, myself included, have seen that they have a lot of pending free agents, right? And it, it might, they might not be able to keep the band together down there in Raleigh. Yeah. Um, but I tease this at the top of the show and I want to close with this as my thought and then I'll give you the last word. We'll talk a lot about this in the off season, but I am not worry about the teams that are giving up all these draft picks the Bruins the Knights the Hurricanes they've perpetually given up a lot of draft picks but they've perpetually found veteran players to make themselves competitive um the Rangers have done some similar things the Lightning have done similar things and sure they might be tied against the cap sure they might have a lower ranked farm team but I'm telling you, Kyle, in the NHL, <clears throat> if you draft a guy, it's going to be, unless it's McDavid or Bedard, you know, it's going to be a few years before they're an impact player in the NHL. And for these teams to be giving up their first round picks, but to still be competitive, I think it goes to show that in the NHL, there's no substitute for team 
team controlled veterans. Um, and that's what first round picks yield you. Um, so if the Bruins give up a first round pick in 2022, but they get Hampus Lindholm for eight years, I'll take it. You know, if the, if the Knights give up their first round picks, but they have a team as deep as they have and they're defending cup champions, I'll take it. So I'll give you the last word on that. We'll have plenty to talk about it in the off season, but any, I'll give you the last word on maybe that, that, uh, school of thought no i mean it's it's pretty smart i mean just look what my football team did they said f them picks won the super bowl <laughs> um so like i mean it makes sense i mean in hockey it's so hard to find talent that's gonna affect you right away and as we've seen the last few years we have seen not that many superstars come out in the first round it takes a lot of years for players to get caught up right i mean um, shane right is what playing junior right now. I mean, Bedard and McDavid and Matthews and stuff. I mean, they are outliers. The rule is usually that you get drafted and then you end up probably playing juniors or NCAA again. And you know, that like you end up being in a perpetual rebuild, which is kind of like what the Columbus blue jackets are going to be, or the, you know, that's their franchise existence is a perpetual rebuild. And it happens across sports. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, I hate to say it, that's an old man's league, but it's more of an, it's an experienced league. You have to literally have the experience, have the size, the skill, and the talent. I mean, you can have the pure talent, but you need a mix of everything. You can't just have one or the other. I mean, right. Carter Bernard's a great talent. He's going to need a lot of players around him to be as successful. Um, but I still think he's still going to need at least another couple years yeah. to be Connor McDavid. How often did Edmonton draft at number one overall? And they, how many Stanley Cups do they have? Zero. Yeah. You know? So I mean, those teams that grab the number one, I'm talking like surefire number one guys. Like, of course, when the Blackhawks picked Kane number one overall in 2007, it took them three years to win their cup, right? With Taves and Kane and Seabrook and those guys. Right, that was three years after they drafted number one overall. They also had a good team around them, and they were original six franchise, right? Like with um, with with these other teams, it's like the, look at the Montreal Canadiens. They are a per, they're going to be in a perpetual rebuild forever. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, Cole Caulfield's cute and stuff, but you know, it's like Nick Suzuki, nice. They traded for him. Like they're they're not like they're going to be in a perpetual rebuild. No offense, but like some, I worried about the New Jersey Devils up until last year. You know, now it seems like they're they maybe they they're still very young, but like I worry about some of these teams. Look at the Buffalo Sabers. How many years have we heard? Well, next year's the Sabers year. Same with the Senators. I mean, how many times do you have to sit there and watch a team draft in the top five, draft in the top five, draft in the top five? Sometimes mm -hmm. even in the NBA, it doesn't even work out. You know, like. I don't know. I like the Celtics. I'm just gonna I'm not getting into an NBA discussion, but like what? Brown and Tatum were drafted in the top five back to back years. They haven't uh won a title yet. And that they Tatum was drafted seven years ago. So it's like how often how much stock do you want to put in it, right? And I don't know. That's just my take about, you know, as we're talking about these playoff teams. You know, sure, you got to draft a guy number one in overall once in a while. But in a vacuum, that's not going to win you a Stanley Cup. So I per personally, like your first round pick, if it's in the 20s, let it fly. Go trade it for a, you know, the Bruins trading in their first round pick. Everyone's all upset about it. If the standings hold, that first round pick's going to be 28, 27, something like that. Like, I'm sorry, but I'd much rather yeah. have. I mean, I hate to bring home or. Somebody else. No, I, mean, I hate bringing football into it, but I mean, look at the two best coaches to be to have drafted in the last twenty plus years, and that would be Bill Belichick and Sean McVay. For example, last year, Sean McVay drafting these third round, fifth round players to become superstars within the first year or so. It's just like, oh, like Puka, yeah, it's Puka, Kobe Turner, uh, like just naming a few guys. It's just like it's all about your coaches and your GM picking the right guys that you know it's going to fit your system 
and who are going to develop into potentially some of the best players. Right. I mean, like the Bruins drafted Zach Hamill number eight overall in 2007. All right. Obviously, they weren't going to get JVR, although JVR is now on the Bruins, thankfully, you know, 15 years later. <laughs> but, you know, they, they weren't going to get those guys at one, two and three because they were drafting eight. Right. But they drafted Zach Hamill, who I think played half a year for them and. If you look at the guys drafted after him, it was Max Pacioretty and Logan Kucher and other people. And you know, you, then you look at the 2015 Bruins draft, and they missed on three straight picks. I mean, I like Jake DeBrus, but he's not a first. I don't think he's a first round talent. I think he's a middle six winger for you, and he, I like him. But I mean, they they passed on Kyle Connor and uh, Matt Barzell and a, a lot of other great players in 2015, and they had three consecutive first round picks. And none of those guys are on the team. In fact, they traded one of them last week for Andrew Peak. So anyway, long story short, I told you I'd let you have the last word. I ended up babbling. I appreciate you guys for tuning in to another episode here of I'm in Rush. We'll be back soon in April, um, right before the playoffs, to give you all the scoop on what's going to happen in the most exciting playoff tournament of all four major sports. In the meantime, check us out on social media you can follow us here and you can uh, subscribe on the youtube down below that would be awesome um enjoy the rest of the hockey season regular season if we don't chat again kyle and march madness mm-hmm. and oh i should point out may university of maine is playing the university of no hardware also known as the university of new hampshire on saturday night in orono big quarterfinal tilt in the hockey's playoffs, I'll be rooting hard for the Black Bears. That's a solid team. The Nadeau brothers are awesome. One of them is a Carolina Hurricane prospect. And uh just goes to show the Bruins, oh, my God, their farm system's horrible. But uh Jeremy Swayman was drafted in, I think, the fourth round. All right? Then he was a Hobie Baker finalist at Maine. So watch that college hockey. Mason Lowry played at Ohio State. Johnny Beecher played at Michigan. So uh, college hockey matters. So just a little plug there. We'll see if they are able to knock off the Wildcats. Kyle, thank you for to, uh, uh, using and dealing with my babbling. No problem. We'll catch you guys all on the flippity flip. But until then, you've been listening to Home Field. Oh, on Man Rush. See, I'm in. I'm in. A, we're doing it. We're closing it. We're closing it. <laughs> <laughs>